What's going on, everybody? And welcome to week number two of the Amazon EU Masters. My name is Butchballs. I'm joined by Dagda. And, uh, you know, last time you saw us, we were a lot closer together. I've come back to England. Dagda, you're so far away. I feel so distant. I know. How are we supposed to be just, like, reunited soon, though? It'll be all right. You know, don't worry. We got this weekend coming up. We're back together. I'll fly over especially to see you, all right? Okay, well, I'll see you soon. But first, we've got some games coming up. And uh, it's it's been a banger of an EU Masters so far, right? We've already finished week number one. That was a few days ago. We actually have some replays of what happened on Sunday's games because, man, as always here at the Amazon EU Masters, it was a hell of a day. Yeah, Ego Rogue managed to take down Eintracht Spandau, looking pretty damn good as they did so. And I think it's been it's, it's been exceptional to kind of see Ego Rogue as they kind of move back through the uh, the split as well, being able to take that second place, not able to beat down Vitality B, so it means that's sitting at two and one. But we'll have to see if they can keep it up. Yeah, X7 as well, having a pretty great series for themselves and crucially now still maintaining their lossless streak here in the EU Masters. And that's having a great job on uh, on the Zaya there and uh, Sanity doing his best. But unfortunately, that's too many feathers to deal with. It was definitely a chaotic game, that has to be said. But X7 showing that this is a team to be feared. Yeah, and I definitely think a lot of people kind of uh, looking at this team in a different light after they were able to take down Carmine Corp as well over the course of the week. So I think a lot of people kind of giving due respect to this squad as well. And we have Bifrost as well, who were able to come in and take down their opposition. And uh, I mean, I just love, again, how hectic these team's fights were, but just about Bifrost able to take that one. That's literally what I was about to say as well, like how chaotic all of these clips are and how much of this comes down to mechanical play as well. I feel like almost every clip we get to see these players popping off individually and finding the big outplays just like we just saw Andro do there. Yeah, exactly. Vitality B taking themselves into the two and one spot, not particularly able to get themselves up again to that 3-0. So I think for, uh, sorry, they are sitting at the 3-0, but I think for um, Vitality B, for the LFL in general, like they are going to be super happy with the way that their performances have gone thus far. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of teams going to be happy with how it's going as we've got three teams 3-0 and at the top of their groups, but still a lot to play for over the course of this week, as you can see. Okay, got managing to get themselves a win towards the end of uh, last Sunday. And then our final replay, I believe, was Fnatic. Managing to finish things off, managing to get themselves a game on the board as well. Yeah, great to see them able to work through this like strong mid jungle with the volley bear and the blunk and able to kind of set up being in that bot side to take over. It just felt like they had such a good understanding of how they wanted to approach the game in that regard. Yeah, fantastic stuff coming out from Fnatic TQ. And with Sunday's games under wraps, before we jump into today's games, we've got a cheeky little pre-show interview. So I'm going to welcome Gabo to the stream as well from Atleta. And uh, straight off the bat, Gabo, I want to ask you, because every single day I'm watching the intro to the Amazon EU Masters, and every single day I see your NAR clip where you use the stopwatch, turn it around and get the kill onto the jinx. Like, man, that's got to feel good. Watching your own outplay time and time again with the cool editing and stuff, that's got to be a, a superstar moment. Yeah, absolutely. The the montage or like the work they did in that video is uh, is incredible like uh, i really enjoyed it uh, i can't deny I, I i watched it many times as well uh, i'm sad i cannot <laughs> do the same right now i mean i didn't i was not uh, able yet to do like some kind of like big play in your masters yet but maybe it will change today so you've been to EU Masters now a couple of times. Like, what is kind of the learnings that you've taken away from it every time? Because it feels like when you're going up against some of the best that Europe has to offer, you've got to be able to take some learnings from that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, coming from like a minor region or like minor IRL, like Italy, it's always like hard to to try and get out of uh, of the group. But uh, even like we are zero three now, and obviously we are not uh, we are not like top contenders for this group. But it, it didn't feel like we were like absolutely demolished by the other teams. And I would say that we are always taking something from them. And uh, yeah, hopefully, like after the preparation and after like uh, experiencing the, the stronger teams last week, we will be able to like do some some upsets today. You know. <laughs> All right. Well, fingers crossed. We're looking forward to some upsets, mate. Good luck in your games today. You got three left, and I'm I'm hoping against hope for you. Yeah, I'm hoping we get to see some some cheesy stuff on the rift. Thank you so much for the interview, mate. And good luck in your games today. Um, 
with that said bye bye guys thanks for having me thanks very much uh with all of that said we've got to crack on with our show our games are flying towards us so let's look at the standings of where we are right now dagda because as i said before we've got three teams three and oh in their groups right now and we're going to be looking towards group d today yeah, and we're going to be looking at LDLC sitting at 3-0 and on the top of the table to see if they'll be able to keep that standing. And as he said, LFL, 3-0 and for Vitality B, 3-0 and for LDC, and it's Carmine Corp who were taken down by a ecstatic X7, I will say, to uh, put the uh, the Isle of Man team at the top of Group B. So definitely a lot for uh, these teams to kind of show up over the course of this week and try and prove that they deserve to keep those 3-0 and streaks. Yeah, and it's, it's exciting as well that we have so many groups where it's still very much up. Yeah, right. Even these zero threes, they're not out of the running just yet. If they have a great performance today, they can make it back in. But like Group C, for example, totally up in the air on who makes it through at this stage. And even just for the second place positions in each of the other groups, it's all still to play for. We're going to be going through this week group by group. So if we look, take a look at the games that are going to be coming up to your screen today, it's Group D. As you can see, each of the Group D teams will play three times today against each of their opponents. So, Dagda, me and you, we're going through our first three games today together, start off with Bison's versus LDLC. Yeah, and I'm super excited to see how this group is going to pan out. It does feel like LDLC are kind of a cut above uh, a lot of the teams at the moment. But, I mean, as we heard from Gabo in the interview, honestly, Atleta kind of gave them a run for their money. Uh, I think they gave a good shot at that series where it kind of felt like LDLC just had better understanding of how to play the map. But when it came down to team fighting, when it came down to just throwing haymakers, it felt like Atleta were going to be able to bring it. So I'm excited for some yeah. of these games. I feel like this group has a lot of teams that are more than willing to just yeah. go for a play. And that's the kind of League of Legends I love. I love teams that are willing to make a play. And this Bison's lineup is certainly within that list, especially Gooby, a player who is actually very, very experienced on the roster. And if you think back to the Makers lineup that made it to quarterfinals in 2021 spring, Gooby was one of the star players on that roster. So I'm excited to see him back in the forefront once more. Yeah, and you even think back towards like random playing on Isuba as well, but we'll have to look across at their opponents here because uh, when you talk about veterancy, I mean, look at this roster, right? You have Doss, who was promoted from the Misfits Premier roster to play in the LEC. You've got Ika, who's played in EUV LCS. He's played in NA LCS. Like, there are so many people that have kind of been at that upper echelon and looking to get back to that sp spot as well now. I mean, when we, when we talk about experience, Ika's more experienced than half of the LEC players are yeah. right now in yeah. terms of like just sheer time played, but also leagues played it right this guy's a bit of a globe trotter so i'm excited to see what ldlc are bringing to the table today once again because guess what they're three and zero and we'll see if they can keep that streak running they are the first seed from the lfl after all but we're in the champs select back there so let's talk picks and bans zin zao gonna be our first fight today i'm gonna have to give a caveat to this one where bison's drafts are bonkers <laughs> what you've got a nasus that you can flex that can be a flex between everywhere except for top that's kind of nuts so i'm excited to see what we bring out to this team i think it's got some really cool drafts and uh, as you can already see the seraphine being banned away ldlc are more than aware of what this bot lane likes to play yeah definitely the seraphine gone zeri being taken off the board as well but it's vistayans on the side of bison's right the zaya the ari as well and then another enchanter now taken off by ldlc so i feel like a lot of uh, bot lane focus here in the picks and bans so far, right? Four bans towards that bottom lane. And a center hover. I would I would have yeah. assumed a jungle first pick here, though. Yeah, I don't think it'll be the center pick, but Mirin as well, big karma player, which is why we're seeing that taken off the board. So, uh, okay, actually going to go All for right. the Soraka lock-in <laughs> straight off the board. So, I mean, look, we said the drafts don't really follow your normal meta pattern, and we're already seeing this. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I definitely didn't expect a first pick Soraka today. But there we have it. We're going to see it anyway. And uh, I'm looking at that Aatrox hover. We've seen a little bit of Aatrox. We've seen what some of these teams can do when they manage to pull that kind of team together. But it's going to start off with the fellows here for LDLC. So a bit more safe and stable and usual. So far. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the difference between these two teams. LDLC kind of play your more standard draft, standard League of Legends. Whereas Bison, honestly, I think coming into this, they're kind of keeping the Super League dream alive, the LVP Super League dream alive of like what we saw from Creme Royale, but tease back in 2021 of these funky picks. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the Soraka kind of flex between Random and Oscura in the bot side of the map as well. Like Random's already brought out the Ivor mid in the Amazon EU Masters. So <laughs> it feels like we'll probably be something. Okay, they came in with a game plan that they don't care about on Bison's. They're just launching it. 
into this. They're just going for global lasers. They've got the global heal laser. They've got the global death laser. Like, <laughs> lasers galore <laughs> on the side of Bison's right now. I just want to quickly mention that Aatrox hopper that we saw from LDLC as well. The first time these two teams played last week, uh, Aatrox was part of that composition. Aatrox, Karsix, LeBlanc, yeah. all with a Yumi for DOS as well. It was brutal so i think ldlc give it a little nod to that but now their final lock into the first round it's gonna be an orm they're playing scaling yeah i mean it kind of feels like for ragnar this is kind of his bread and butter right it's much more tended towards like the graguses the orans the kind of the the weak side tank top laners where he's able to kind of provide a little bit more tools of engagement in those later fights and now we kind of got to see what the plan is because i honestly thought ldlc might try and pick up something for ika especially with the ari already taken off the board kind of things like the the leblanc start to rise up in priority orianas and um, these kind of things that can do really well in the mid lane match but give you a lot of priority because the way that ldlc tend to play around ika is is he'll kind of be on his own but they will want to try and like move him around the map to help interact with side lanes especially if one side of the map is getting a lot of attention so i think something like a blanc ban could actually work out pretty well here for bisons alongside that victor ban we'll see trundle going to be taken off the board as well not wanting uh the, the jungle match up there which does make me think that this uh Karthus could well go down towards that bottom lane if trundle is being banned away there probably uh, Gooby taking that on the bottom side. But now with Yumi banned away from DOS, as we mentioned, that's what Bison had to deal with the first time these two teams played. So over to LDLC. Looks like a blind pick support here. And again, I've been wrong before. Yeah, I mean, I imagine they will go towards the Leona, especially with the, the Nautilus locked in there. Like, you just get the better side of the uh, the matchup. You get to go for these quick engages, set up well for the Aphelios, and kind of just pairs well overall with a strong team fight composition. And I kind of like that LDLC are going, hey, look, we're just going to give Ika the counter pick because we want to see where these picks are going because there's just so much flexibility what Bison are bringing to the table right now. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of flexibility. That is the the only word that I've got right now because definitely not a, a composition that looks consistent as the Lucian will be locked in. They were yeah. hovering a Nami as well, which could mean so. it is that Karthus jungle after all. And that would mean solo lane Soraka, but also solo lane so, Nautilus or Karthus a, mid. Still, I, so I'm going to say the Lucian top because Mirman has played this Lucian into the Orn match before. Um, we've also seen Random play the Karthus, so I think it is Karthus mid. But I think then that's where it gets a little bit funky. So maybe they are actually just going to flex this Karthus to Albatraber in towards the jungle. You've now yeah. got the Aurelia as well. Um, but I mean, we've even seen Doinby play playing things like the Nautilus mid. So I think it's, again, keeping open a lot of flexibility. Um, and I think if you're going to go for the AP Karthus, I imagine actually it could be the Lucian mid then. So Aurelia, Karthus, Lucian, and then Soraka AD carry potentially here. <laughs> Who knows at this stage? I, you know what, Doctor? Let's find out. Let's let the players decide and figure it out from there. Because at this point, it's like a jigsaw piece, except they're all the same okay, color, yeah. so you can't figure it out. Uh, on the side of LDLC, though, very stock and standard, right? This yeah. is your go-to, uh, like, scaling composition for this season, right? From every single league that we've seen, these are some of the strongest scaling picks in every single yeah, I mean, this is just incredibly strong from LDLC. Pretty much bog standard, great team fight, and great level six setup as well from the Orianna if you want to try and play through the mid jungle. And I think that's kind of where Bison are looking at playing, right? When you see the Lucian mid with this Karthus, it's like, hey, look, Lucian will get guaranteed priority in this mid lane. So allow that Karthus to kind of farm, protect him in the early stages, especially from a strong jungler like the, uh, the Viego. So just make sure that he's able to farm up and then you kind of answer with a lot of this late game power in the cart, this in the heels from the Soraka who is going into the AD carry role. So you will yep. see like just kind of farm it up. And I expect then that's also going to lend itself a lot to like opening up this Nautilus to try and roam around. So I'll be expecting DOS to try and move around and try and um, counteract that, especially in these early stages. Now, you know, we were talking about Gooby's veterancy earlier on. Like this is a player that likes to be a little bit weird down in the bottom lane. He's yeah. played Soraka twice before in his career. He's won both of those games. So it's a solid pick for him, at least from what I can see statistically. Whether or not they can execute this composition, though, is a different question. Because, Dactor, I mean, what is the game plan when you've got this kind of ragtag team that the Bisons have put together? 
yeah, a lot of it is about like trying to play around the early stages where the Lucian has a good amount of priority and like let the Karthus farm up, right? Like Karthus very much a farming style jungler and you want to try and see if you can support that to a certain extent. And um, I think you'll have good priority in the top side of the map as well, just because you've got this rally into Orin, you can shove the wave. So I think it's trying to facilitate Karthus to scale into the late game. And then you can try and play through like side lanes if you want to with the Aurelia and the Lucian. You've got the opportunity to try and take some of these crazy fights where Aurelia is a frontliner which can take a lot of beating because you've got the Soraka to back her up. Then your Karthus is providing a lot of damage with your mid laner. So it's kind of like shifting the priority a little bit in who is going to be the, the actual damage dealers and who's going to be your main tank. So my question then, Doctor, is mm -hmm. if, if the game plan for Bison is to kind of scale up and do damage later on, well, how good is their scaling comparatively to what LDLC are bringing to the Because as I said before, yeah. I feel like they've kind of ticked the box in every single lane of like great super scaling late game team fighting champions. Like, can these two drafts match up in the late game? Yeah, I think the big thing is that if Bison is able to allow this Aurelia and this Karthus to get onto the Aphelios, right? Because Aphelios is going to be your mainstay carry in this, where he's got your most of your DPS. So I think if you're able to get the Aurelia to dive into the back line, she's got the heals from Samraka, she's then got the ult from Karthus coming in on top of it. That's a lot of damage focused onto this Aphelios. And if you can take him out of the equation, I think that's wonderful. If not, I think this is going to start to fall apart a bit because you've just got such insanely strong frontliners with the Leona and the Orn and the Oriana as well to try and buy space and shields it feels like when you're going for this kind of heavy dive focus i will say from uh, the aurelia and the Karthus kind of working together i think you've got a good answer here in ldlc so i imagine what we'll probably see instead is uh bison trying to open up and play one some sort of one three one because i just don't see moments where they'll be able to easily interact with like setting up flanks for the aurelia to get access to that back line yeah, we'll have to see. What One thing I'm just excited about in general as well is the fact that we have LDLC coming in today as first seed from the LFL, the region that has won back-to-back -back EU Masters over the last two. I feel like right now with a 3-0 record, they're looking good. They're drafting very clean, very clear, like very simple compositions, I guess, in terms yeah. of what the win condition is. But when you look at the week one games that LDLC had, they weren't all necessarily the cleanest of wins. I feel like that's what we're looking for today, right? For LDLC is to, to clean things up just a little bit and try and deny some of the chaos that some of these other teams will bring to the table. Yeah, I feel like sometimes you just see LDLC getting a bit bloodthirsty. And I don't know if it's a case of like, you know, they are sitting, uh, look, well, at least the early games are looking quite strong and uh, good where they're able to get a ton of vision down early. Uh, I think Yike is probably one of the best players that we have, at least best junglers that we have in the league at like tracking where the enemy jungler is and kind of setting up his pathing for that. I'm, I love the early pathing that we see coming through from Yike. So I think that's going to be a lot of what we're looking for in the early stages. And then kind of looking at them to pull back in the mid game where it's like, hey, look, we got one pick, we got two mm -hmm. picks and have that discipline to just go right now. We will go towards the objective or we will reset to get our waves in order. That's kind of the one thing that I've seen missing from LDLC's um, game plan overall but i think that's more so a case of hey look they're in the amazon eu masters they've been looking really good in the early stages and kind of just being a bit disrespectful honestly to the teams that are in the group well i will say doctor that's not the first time we've seen it from a top team right a little bit yeah. of disrespect we've seen it before as you say and uh it's somewhat to be expected especially during the group stage right ultimately you don't need to go six and zero if you drop one game Generally speaking, it's not the end of the world. Now, I know that's not the most hyped thing to hear, but realistically speaking, I know that's the way a lot of the players will be thinking about it. It's once you get into the quarterfinals, once you get into the best of series, that's when you've got to really buckle down. So I'm, I'm in two minds like to come into this one. On the one hand, I want to see LDLC playing clean, playing immaculate. On the other hand, I'd love to see him messing about a little bit. <laughs> On the other side, though, Bison, we've got plenty of messing about, right? Soraka, yeah. Bolle, Lucian, Mid, we've got to cart this jungle like... I'm so excited to see if they can push their foot forward during this game and challenge LDLs. Yeah, I remember like LeBron last year from Creme Real Betis yeah. back in summer 2021 who's bringing out like the Shackos, the Canes, the Evelyns and this kind of stuff. And like, you always have to be wary of what the, the game plan was going to be. And it feels like that's this very similar story with um, with Bison E-Club right now. Because, I mean, you've got, what was it? Like 16 unique champions played for the AD carry. You've 21 for the mid laner, 16 as well for Mirren in the top lane. Like they have so many different picks you can, uh, they bring to the table. Even like the Nasus bot, the Scion bot, never 
Kamara getting the second one of the, the Soraka bot mm -hmm. this split as well. Like, it's absolutely nuts what Bison Esports Club can do. And I'm here for it. I'm here for every single second of it dagged there. But speaking of those weird picks, I think we should talk jungle pathing because a lot of the viewers might not know how Karthus jungle really operates. It's not a champion that you see that often in the jungle unless you're a high elo player. So talk me through how this Karthus is going to operate throughout the early game. Yeah, so a lot of what Karthus wants to do is farm, right? And farm as efficiently as possible get a whole bunch of gold and then become that big late game threat. So you can already see, right? Like, look at the comparison between the two clears. Like, Yike only now starting up his Raptors where you've got uh, Albatreyer basically uh, an entire camp ahead. And it, he will be looking to have his lane support him a lot. So that's why you're looking at like the Lucian mid, super good at getting priority against the Orianna. So he can lean into, hey, we need help to get a Scutton Crab. Right, now we got Bison who have that support coming from the mid lane. We're looking at the ability to lean off up towards the top side as well and now you've got the Aurelia to make sure that's all good too. Yeah, we'll see if the... I mean, obviously, as you say, solo lane's going to have priority in the early game. That's kind of unarguable. Or not going to do that much to, to pressure onto an Aurelia there. My concern is down in that bottom lane. How much does Soraka Nautilus really bring to the table? Is there a conversation here where LDLC could just start stacking drakes for themselves? Yeah, I honestly think that's probably the best way for LDLC to play it because even when you look at like what this squad from the French wants to do, it's like we want a team fight, right? Like we want to make sure that we're able to set up correctly, you know, get Ragnar and Doss the front line, open up space for Exa Kick to have that uh, Aphelios damage from the back line. And the easiest way to do that is looking at these dragons. And I think Yike has been incredible thus far of kind of like understanding what his goal is in each of the games that he's played, right? And like, this is a very standard clear that you'll see from Yike where he will full clear, get into the enemy jungle, place that ward that he just did, uh, put down as he reset. And now you get full information on where the card this is. And this happens so frequently for LDLC. And it's something that is really good and makes it really difficult to try and get these early kills against them because they generally understand like where the jungle is and how best to track it. Yeah, really, really uh, good vision coming out to try and track, as you say, and, and keep on top of that because that's going to be crucial. Diego, not bad at scaling himself, but I don't think he's going to scale quite as well as Karthus. With that yeah. said, though, it is Viego. So at the end of the day, Karthus dies, which quite often Karthus wants to die during the fights, and then Yike becomes Karthus. Well, that's oh, where boy. issues <laughs> could come along well, for this side it's of the it's also kind of worrying about like how squishy LDLC are. Or sorry, how squishy uh, Bison Esports Club are, right? Because if you get Ica like one big late game shockwave onto like random, onto the Karthus, onto, I mean, heck, even Gooby as well. Like they're just gone. And suddenly now you have that opening for Yike because there's a bunch of low health targets in there. You start to get these resets. You start to have access to a bunch of these like big CC tools from the Nautilus. Like that becomes pretty scary if you're on Bison. It certainly does. And uh, Bison. So far playing it slow as the TP comes back to the mid lane to make sure the random's not missing too much in the way of CS here. But look at LDLC invading, trying to take some stuff away from the Karthus. Albatraver does want to get farming, does want to be able to yeah. protect his jungle. But realistically, with this uh, Leona moving in alongside Yikes, uh, Viego, with the reset from random, it's difficult for him to protect his own jungle. And it's just good timing from LDLC, right? Ika had push in mid. Doss consistently has push with Exa Kick and bot side. So Doss just leaves uh, bot side first, links up with Ika and does with Yike. And now you're starting to get that control that you need. And for Bison, this is something you need to stop because realistically, you don't really have the control from a character to like go for invades in the same way, like say a Graves would, right? Because he's got great clear, he's tanky, he's got the ability to escape away. And like, that's kind of how you can work with a traditional farming jungler. But with the Karthus, you just don't really have that tool. Random going with a culling in the mid lane there just to try and get more pressure onto Ika. Obviously, Ika was not level six just yet. Now just ticking over to that level six mark. So Random just trying to find pressure there. Not enough though to deter LDLC in the early game. We mentioned it before. Going for those strikes straight off the back. It's uh, straight off of the bat. Sorry, at six minutes, LDLC gonna grab that first cloud drake of the game for themselves. Once the Ike finish that one off. So a nice little start here from LDLC. Slow and steady supposedly wins the race, Dagda, uh, which is kind of crazy because last time we saw these two teams play, it was a 28-minute game with more than a kill a minute. It was this composition from LDLC with an Aatrox, a Karzix, a LeBlanc, all with a Yumi on their shoulders. This is a very different version of the squad than what we saw. 
Yeah, but what I gotta say is like, this is kind of standard LDLC, right? Like when you look at the way that they play the game, it's very slow. Again, like great vision control. Like there's one that was just placed by Ragnar in this top side. So they spot out where the cart this is, right? And like, you start to think, all right, well, this is gonna be like super slow from LDLC. They don't get many kills. And that's not true. They just take their early game incredibly slow. Like if you look at their, um, their first blood rate from like the LFL, 44% not incredibly high you look at their goal difference of 15 on average it's zero not exactly very high <laughs> especially for a team that came first but they do have the most one of the most kills in the uh, the lfl as well actually the most kills in the lfl as a team so it's this mid game where they explode where they take a very slow approach to the early game start to build up these little advantages and then when they hit the mid game that's where they go nuts. yeah and i feel like you're you're very aware of that fact back there because i saw yike channeling his stunner sort of go towards albatray but i was ready to go you just continue talking because you know that yeah. it's not happening <laughs> they're not actually gonna go for play here just try to get some threat onto the enemy board here we're almost broaching the eight minute mark three and a half minutes until the drake comes up but the herald is going to be coming up here and we keep on talking about this priority the ldlc have in the bottom side that's often used to lane swap your ad carry up towards that top side and go for it yeah, we haven't really seen that from LDLC, though. They've been perfectly happy, honestly, to just, like, keep X and kick bot side. Especially when you got an Aphelios here, right? Like, why not just play for the fact Aphelios can take these turrets incredibly hard? And uh, Yike now can make a play top. Merwin's in trouble. There's the stun onto Merwin. Can he dodge the call of the Forge? Got good flash. Good little resets as well. Wait Bit a of damage sec. coming up from the beams. Merwin turning it around. Yike drop flashes into the brush. But there's coming out from Ragnar. And that was a little closer than uh, it was comfortable, I will say, I'm for Yike heartbroken. there. Having to flash away from that one, but does manage to escape away. The big thing, though, is that you actually saw Bison trying to make a move down to this bottom side, see if they could link up with the card, this to have that gank onto Exekick and DOS, but rightfully so, they backed away. And now Exekick knows he's free to just stay in this bot lane. He doesn't need to rotate because there is actually no real threat up towards the stop side of those. They say that. Looks like LDLC going to back away with Mira and TPing in and Random having that priority in mid lane. Yeah, Ragnar has uh, just finished his boots now, which makes him officially completely and utterly invisible. Let's take another look because it was a damn good try. Yeah, and I love the way you're playing. This is Miron, right? Like consistently going towards the creep so you get the big C. Uh, you get the healing off consistently. You're getting the resets on your Q. And especially when you're looking at the use of the, the W there as well, being able to block so much damage, it just makes it super nice for Miron to nearly take them down. But unfortunately, just not quite enough damage in the tank. Skewer just went off to the side of the mid lane, but Doss is here as well. So neither mid laner will be able to do much of that. Anything on that one. I'll betray, but though. We'll get the top side scuttle crab. That Herald we talked about, still on the map. Nobody looking towards that one. As you said, LDLC, not a team that historically uh, tries to focus too much on that one. But a 20 CS lead down in that bottom lane. And with that kill, the top lane looking real nice for LDLC as well. It's feeling like a good early game for them. Like, it feels like yeah. exactly what we said. This is the game plan, right? Slow and steady, scale up, get your own items, get three items on your Orianna and your Aphelios, and then go for the team. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie, I kind of get a bit nervous when I just see an Aphelios get into free farm, right? Yeah. Like, you can see he's got the most gold in the game uh, thus far, like, just barely eking out on random, but he's going to start being able to take turret plates now against the Serac as well, who won't really have the wave clear that she needs to try and hold off against them, so especially when he gets an Infernum in his back pocket, so I think for X to kick, like, actually staying down here is going to be perfect. You can see there, Infernum picked up, now he gets to approach the Terror, and Gooby can't really fight against them, so X to kick will just get to take these turret Yep, takes a plate for free there. It's extended that gold lead ever so slightly. There's a bit of pressure coming out from Bison. Uh, but you mentioned how, like, you know, you're getting nervous watching this Aphelios farm. I'm also nervous for the side of Bison's if you're going into a game where it's straightforward against this kind of veterancy. Like, you know LDLC are gonna be able to win out on map trades. You know that their macro is fantastic. You know that they have the veterancy with players like Ika on this roster to be able to win a straightforward game of League of Legends. When I'm watching these tournaments, I love to see teams like Bison's coming into a game like this and bringing a bit more chaos. And yes, they've gone for a bit of a weird draft, but ultimately bringing much chaos to the board. I say that though, they've started the second Drake without much pressure to do so. 
Yeah, I think that's the problem, is that Bison had a moment to try and go for this uh, dragon if they wanted to. Especially when you saw Yike committing resources to the Rift Herald, but instead they tried to make the play bot, they don't really start it up fast enough, and it means that LDLC are able to take the Rift Herald, get the reset that they need from DOS, and then threaten the dragon as well. So you never actually get the opportunity now as Bison to kind of make the counter punch. Uh, Ooh, Shockwave in the mid lane onto Random. He's in trouble. He's low. Gale Force already used. Flash forward as Ica grabs himself a solo kill. That was gorgeous from Ica. Consistently just making sure that he's able to play around the minions, not giving the, uh, the cunning much time to hit, especially when you've got that Shockwave coming in. And Random goes down. So now LDLC with no mid laner, they'll happily take this second dragon. They certainly will. And crucially, Random had a Slash available for that Shockwave. Did not expect the amount of damage that was going to come out from Ica. And that's the thing about Oriana. People don't think about this champion as one that's going to look for solo kills. But if you miss position, this champion will punish you hard. Yeah, and I mean, you could just see it there. Right now, you get to back up as Ica. You're going to be able to finish off your first mythic item as well. TP just about to come up to go into the mid lane. Just going to clear out these uh, creeps. So it feels like just to finish off that last little bit of gold. But actually, no, not going to reset. So I thought he, at least with the gold there, he'd reset and try to finish off his... Um, I uh, the Luton's Echo just to start things off with, but uh, just gonna stick around a mid, and now we gotta see if Doss and Yike can make a play happen because Doss is hovering around here. Maybe a chance to try and force a Drake while the Gale Force is there. Random uh, does have his Gale Force on cooldown currently, but it's not long until that one comes back up, and Bison's taking their opportunity to get control of Vision in River. Remember that Drake is still on the board. LDLC got the Cloud Drake to start things off. Nobody willing to commit to this straight. You can see Exa Kick as well. Halfway up the lane, so he'd be able to back away if anything happens. The TP back out from Ica to rejoin in the mid lane. Has now finished that Ludens as a play in the top side. Yike happy to forego the Drake. Great predict from Ragnar. Can they actually shut down this Aurelia? Marwin diving around the lane, but I don't think he has the damage. There's the stun coming on through. The heal though, last second. Yike in trouble. The second time now, Merwin almost does it. Yeah, you can see though exactly how long this Aurelia can live though, especially when you've got the help from the Soraka and also you're gonna have that Karthus damage come through. But unfortunately, Merwin oh. been kind of put in the dirt here and it feels like, at least from the Ike side, he's going, look, Dragon would be super nice. Getting this Rift Tower would be great, but realistically what we want to do is try to like set Miran behind because yeah. that's going to be the main problem for LDLC and team fights. Like if this already is able to wipe out Exa Kick, well then the already can probably carry the fight or at least Random should be able to carry the fight then as the only remaining AD carry. But Miran not having the best of times with the attention Yike has gotten. And unfortunately the character this jungle just can't respond to that pressure that the Viego is able to put down. No, not so far. Crucially, as well, like, it's a bit of a heartbreaker, you know, that Merwin can't turn the, the kill around. That's twice now that we see that happen. But another heartbreaker on the other side for LDLC. As the Herald was charging, the play's timed out. So yeah. they got one extra play on the top side. Didn't, you know, they get the first tower gold. It's still good to get that tower down, but just a split second too late to get themselves an extra 320 gold. That would have been nice for them. But speaking of gold as well, I just want to quickly mention the mid laner and the bot laner for LDLC. Look at that far. This is what happens when Aphelios is uncontested to the bot side. Exa kick. I'm not sure he's missed a minion this game. 160, almost 170 CS at 15 minutes. That's well over 10 CS per minute. Yeah, you can already see the last Whisper picked up as well. Going to end up working up towards the... Uh the Lord Dominic's regard very quickly. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised to see him pick up like the Bloodthirster third item here as well. Like usually you'd go for something like the Infinity Edge, but I think with like just that extra survivability against the Aurelia, having the ability to heal up against the Karth Assault is actually going to be pretty impactful, especially if Gooby's going to be providing a, um, a bunch of healing from the back line. And you don't really have much in the way of uh, Grievous Wounds apart from the Bramble Vest top lane, which isn't really going to do too much in fights. Not for the time being. I feel like we do need to see more of that coming on oh through. Here's the Orn combo. Merwin trying to go for the 1v1. That's a lot of armor, though. It doesn't matter. Merwin, when there's no Viego in that top side, finds his opportunity. Yike has to answer in the bottom side. I'm a Traber hiding in the brush here. Two people under the tower, both with global ultis, but they won't help necessarily in close range. Exa kick, moving forward, drops his turret. I don't think the dive can happen. You can see, though, that Ragnar not used to playing a competitive match against the Soraka. Like, tries to go for the 1v1 and forgets that you've still got that ultimate on the Soraka. And I think that's going to be such a big, crucial tool here as the game goes on. But Doss now. Doss 
wants to go into random. It's going to be the shockwave that goes wide. It doesn't matter. With three people strong in the mid lane, LDLC find yet another kill. That's four on the board and more pressure onto these tier one towers. And that's a 3,000 gold lead opening up from the kills, from the CS lead we're seeing in the bot side of the map as well. And right now, LDL still, LDLC still have run of the mill. They still got the opportunity here to like fight with Ikon now, who's got that Luden's Tempest completed. You can start to look towards things like this Rift Herald as well on the top side. Like you have so many options here for LDLC. And unfortunately for Bison, you know, they just haven't been able to find the moments where you can try and get these early kills on the card that's like snowball him into an advantage. Because where is your real threat here when um, you just don't have like your bot lane able to fight against the Aphelios? You've no opportunity here for the Aurelia to really find those kills either. Wait a second, back there. LDLC are taking the Herald and the bot lane tower. This is meant to be the trade. This is meant to be the team that doesn't get Herald gets the bot lane tower. Not, the, not both. LDLC are taking everything. Yeah, Bison just went for like quick backs there that meant that they didn't have anyone on the map as LDLC went straight for that Rift Herald. So now Bison kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, right? You've got this Aphelios who's going to be mega fed, like over 200 CS and gotten that turret plate solo. Like it's not even the fact they got the, just the turret plate solo, the experience solo that he has gotten is absolutely insane. Like he's the same level as the solo laners. Like this Aphelios is huge right now. Certainly is two hundred CS. As you say, close to finishing years. off the Lord <laughs> Doms as well. Like ah, this is gonna get real scary. The thing is, we're talking about a scaling matchup. We've been saying scaling. The word scaling, I'm sick of saying it at this point, because for the last 18 minutes we've been talking scaling, right? It's a four thousand gold lead for LDLC, and Bisons want to change that onto the top side. Ragnar the target here, hooking onto the tower, trying to get the CC chain there. But Ragnar is tanky, knocking them up. But Merwin has enough life still, enough healing. Uh, I don't think it even matters. <laughs> yeah, but the problem is you're still losing out on the map. Tier 2 got to fall on the bot side thanks to that Rift Town. You got pressure here from Exit Kick alongside Doss in the mid lane. So your mid lane tier 1 is nearly going down. This isn't really a trade up for Bison despite the kill. Wait, this Herald is going to get a charge on the inhib tower yeah. as well. Nobody here to stop it. That's going to be a bonus charge. It's a one for one trade in terms of towers. A tier 1 for a tier 2. Not... Oh, favoring so bison mid. here and i feel like we're looking at merwin right this is the guy that's got to carry on the side of bison's based on what we've seen so far this game yeah but i'm also looking at his build and kind of scratching my head a little bit like you go for the blade oh. of the rune king and now you got the sunfire all right all right uh, I hey you said you needed him to front line in the team fights i guess he, he got that memo yeah, I just don't know if I'm fully sold on this. Um, I honestly think, like, going in towards, like, the, the Gore Drinker, like, the ability to kind of, like, provide even more healing is going to be a lot better. And um, even if you want to go for something like the Triforce as well, to be perfectly honest, like, I think Triforce, when you've got so much healing on you, innately makes you tanky. So having the Triforce, having the Blade of the Rune King kind of, like, synergize super well together. And um, you got a ton of burst that you can try and get onto this back line. Uh, I don't know if I fully agree with the Sunfire in this situation. Like, yes, you'll be tanky and you'll have a good amount of sticking power onto uh, something like Exit Kick, but I think you've got so much innate sustain that you're going to be tanky regardless of what happens. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if he's going to be able to have that sustain. One thing I will say in his defense, at least he, it's fairly safe to assume there's going to be a lot of mortal wounds coming out on the side of LDLC. It's been a while yeah. since we've seen any recalls, but you can anticipate at some point uh, the, the uh, Oblivion Orb coming out from Ica. Exa kick out, maybe wouldn't expect him to build uh, healing reduction himself. It's maybe Yike can go for that instead, but you can anticipate healing reduction. So maybe just wanted to go pure tanky stats. I don't know. I, I don't know why I'm trying to color right now. I, I'll leave that one to you, <laughs> Dagda. But yeah, we'll have to see how this Sunfire Aurelia is going to work out for Merwin. I have to say, though, whether it works or not, regardless of what happens for the rest of this game, I'm loving what Merwin is bringing to the table. Takes this Aurelia, almost two v ones twice. Finds a solo kill. Now go for a Blade of the Root kick with a Sunfire. Like I'm totally on board with this guy. Yeah, I mean, look, the some uh, the sorry, the Blade of the Rune King is going to give him a bunch of percentage health damage regardless, so still will be able to do some damage. I just don't know if he'll have the burst damage to take out Exit Kick, like, alongside the Karthus to actually make it worthwhile is my biggest worry. Um, and even if you wanted to try and play side lanes, it just feels like Triforce does more. But I'll digress anyway as we start to move on, because LDLC, we talked about how strong their vision game is. Already, you can see it setting up in this topside jungle. Like, they've got control there just off the side of mid lane. You've got that topside ward as well 
on like this is how LDLC tend to play out their objective focus and it's always so good to see because honestly I think they're the best sporting team oh big all in in the mid lane that's a combo and a half right there skill gets healed though back to full HP now a laser across the team in comes Merwin looking for recess looking for Q's one kill already Culling gonna go wide on this one but Ragnar damn tanky difficult to deal with but Merwin practically invincible LDLC start the fight, but it's actually even. Yeah, LDLC not quite able to get what they want. Merwin goes for it, though. Oh, misses the knockup. Ragnar kind of fumbled this one. He cc Merwin gets a heal. In goes Yike to try and find the reset. Sorok it out. He can heal his own team, but he's a little too late on it. Random finds the kill. And now the chase down. Looking for the stun. Dodged by Random. He's trying to get into the rush. Trying to play with Vision. Yike on the chase down. Iker's there for the double kill on the dissonance. Iker wants more too. Shockwave on cooldown. But LDLC are happy with that. And they still have their jungler. They still have a ton of damage. They can turn straight over towards this Baron. And for Bison, they've got to look on and kind of shake their heads. That little overextension now costing them so much. Beautiful stuff from LDLC. And Bison, so close to beautiful, right? And that feels the story of the game this entire time. We keep seeing it with Merwin in the top side, almost 2 v one We keep seeing it with the play from Random trying to be aggressive in the mid lane, but going down to Ica. It feels like Bison are so close and yet so far, time and time again. And now, one more. All in onto this Carthus. Can they actually finish this one? I'm not sure if they've got the damage. Apparently they do, but Yike, no ultimate available. That means he's got to get out of dodge. Shockwave though from Ica to protect his jungler. Beautiful bit of team play from LDLC. So they will just escape away. Won't get the cherry on top with the Baron and the kill on to the Karthus. But they are going to be able to escape happy regardless. And we'll see here, right? Like three members underneath this mid lane turret. But they don't spot that Lucian is actually wrapped the whole way around. So they think that they got the opportunity to dive the terror. But the healing comes through. The ultimate from the Karthus still means that he's got uptime in this fight despite the death. And Mirwin, with a great TP straight in behind LDLC, is able to just absolutely decimate them. But... Again here, Mirwin going that little bit too far forward. And even though we have the one for one thus far, just takes that terror shot and that's the go button for LDLC. I'm not sure, Dagda, I don't know if you know this interaction. If anyone on Twitter can let me know. I think Ragnar hit his pillar there, but because it was in the Soraka silence, I'm, I think it might have not done the knockup because of that. I'm not especially yeah, I'm not sure, sure on that one. It looked yeah. a bit funky, but that's cool. If that's the interaction, that's really cool. Really nice follow-up, obviously, from LDLC there. I could get in the double kill, along with the Calibrum from Exekick. And now we've been talking about control. We've been talking about how LDLC played the map. Well, Dagda, they're almost 8,000 gold. They have complete and yeah. utter control. The Drake is there if they want to go for the Ocean Soul. They already have the Baron in their pocket. They can really start to take over. They might just look to snowball this one into a win here. Remember, their first win against Bisons was 28 minutes. We had more than a kill a minute. It's been a very different pace of game in terms of those kills, but not if LDLC just wiped Bisons a few times before they finish the Nexus. Yeah, you've even got Dragon this up as well, which LDLC can try and fall back to after this push, but they just want to try and get the most out of this Baron push. Just 50 seconds left, so they'd only get another wave, so they decide to back away instead. And it feels like you just go to Dragon, get the third one. They can kind of start to siege up, slowly play out this game and wait for the next Baron to wait, uh, come up. Wait for that five minutes until this next Ocean Dragon Soul is available for LDLC. And with the amount of controls they have on the map, when you've got these Ornn items that are starting to come through as well, it just becomes so hard for Bison to try and make this fight happen. We see a reset coming out from Albatreva. The Drake on the map right now. Yike on the bottom side. I feel like you just take the Drake just because it's there, right? Even if you're not looking for Drakes yeah. necessarily. No, like this is just on a silver player. You have to go for this Drake at this point for LDLC. You've got everything. Why not finish it all off? But then the question is, how do they continue with this pressure? As we've said, that bottom lane in hip tower already gone down. Thanks to the... Remember, that Herald charged about half an hour ago, it feels like, at this point. Uh, that's going to help them open up the map the baron now down but i don't think that's gonna stop ldlc no they're perfectly happy you've got this insane front line the ability to dive whatever you want and lucian was spot on the top side so they're just gonna take the turrets tp coming on through yike has to ult defensively over the wall here and i think ldlc will survive they'll back away safely but it is gonna be one ultimate used in trade of a tp i think they're probably happy with that but even still 
It's something for Bisons. Yeah, and it means that the DP won't be up for the next dragon fight as well. So LDLC kind of have that in their back pocket. But the wave is still going to hear. The terror is still going to go down. And now the fight happens. Oh no, Random's in trouble. That's the Inferno oh on everybody. God. Huge combo coming out. LDLC though, they've got a laser on their heads. Merwin trying to get some resets as well. But he just doesn't have the damage. The healing ain't enough. A skill going to be knocked up and will be taken down. It's Yike on the Aurelia now. And he finishes them off. Turns into a unicorn instead. Time to heal the team with the Wow Wow Ambulance. And now, time to break the game open. Exaking has damage and a half to finish this one off. Iker doing massive damage in the fights as well. But I feel like Yike has been the central point for LDLC this game. He's been the one going in alongside Ragnar's ultis. Beautifully done here from the LFL representative, the first seed, who are looking for a flawless day and a flawless group if they can keep this kind of performance. Not a bad start to that day as well, going to four and oh, and a very confident win as well, has to be said, coming through from LDLC. And I think again, like this kind of showcases what the strengths of this team are, like having the slow paced early game, using the vision to their advantage, finding these small advantages in lane. And then when we get to the mid game, they just open up to these great team fights, again, utilizing that vision that they've already set up. And yeah, at times they can go a bit over aggressive. They do get a bit bloodthirsty, but they're just so good in, on the art in the fight and also on the map it makes it hard to shoot them down. really really clean game coming out from ldlc that's what we wanted to see coming in and that's what we got tied up in a nice little bow so ldlc four and zero in the group now we're going to jump into a break but don't forget to stick around because afterwards we're going to go into atleta looking to get that first one on the board up against the unicorns of love sexy edition 